Dogs are in the house. Dogs, they're in the house. I come to you bearing a book to read. Goblin by Josh Mallerman. Great book. Great writer. Great writer. Great writer. There's something about each one of these novellas that transcends the imagination. In fact, I wanted to read to you a bit of one of the novellas, A Mix-Up at the Zoo. Now, Josh Mallerman has not given me permission to read this, and quite frankly, Josh, I don't give a fuck. You can try to sue me. I have no money, so you'll be suing me for no reason. You'll just lose money. Dirk Watt. <laughs> Dirk Rogers woke every day an optimist and fell asleep despaired. Truth was, he was getting tired of the tours. You got 15 eight year olds wetting their pants to see Eula, Dirk. Breaks over. It might not have been so bad. He might not have woken from nightmares of himself leading packs of children down long hallways built of a stone older than the pyramids, coated in a webbing made by no insect he knew of. If he had to work only one tour, one type of tour, because the zoo had him running all week from nine to five every day and the slaughterhouse had him on the weekends. At night, home again. Dirk was beat, bushed. It didn't matter what day it was or really how the day even went. Chasing the kids around, constantly counting heads, locking, unlocking doors, locking, unlocking cages, feeding the animals, cleaning the sludge from the gutters, giving directions, taking orders, answering questions, doing what he could to pick up his co-worker's slack and worrying a lot about his own. He had strong fantasies of an elusive nightlife. He wanted to get off work, shower, and hit the town. He wanted to drink. He wanted to. He wanted company. He certainly wanted to pick up a woman. But no matter how realistic this prospect sounded during the day once home, it was a different Dirk that entered his apartment and opted to sit down, lie down instead. It was a different Dirk that brushed his teeth at night than the one who did the same in the morning. Often before work, He'd take a minute to sit and watch the people pass from a green goblin bench, and often he'd pick a few out. Tonight, that woman and I will meet and make love, or I will cheer that man at the bar. Dirk was electrified by these little visions of human interaction. He'd certainly had enough of the animal kind, but the fantasies were foggy impressions by the time he flopped down in the chair at the kitchen table at night. There the whispers came. Tomorrow, they said, you will be your own boss. You're working too much, Patrick said over beers one night. You've got nothing to spend the money you make on. That's, that's not the way to do it, Dirk. You need to blow your pile, buddy. Get so drunk you ruin your life and start over again. Dirk, ducking his large head toward the foam of his beer, was flooded with fantasies asking a woman what she would like to drink, leading her through a crowd on their way to the dance floor, telling her that he was going to own his own business one day, right here in Goblin. That's right, Dirk would think, any kind of business you want. Or maybe Dirk would melt a woman's heart with stories about the animals. Trudy, Alice, the elephants and the birds. How long ago he returned to the zoo late at night to console Eula on the loss of her baby. How he might have helped her through it. Goblin's prized gorilla was guaranteed to turn any woman's heart to cotton. Even his fantasies weren't safe from the zoo, from the slaughterhouse, from work. Maybe I'd be better for quitting one or the other, Dirk told Patrick that night. Shake things up. Mix things up, Patrick said. And yes, cheers to that. 
Often on his rare nights out with Patrick, Dirk would excuse himself and head to the bathroom where he'd lock the door, set his beer on the sink, and stand quietly against the wall, his eyes closed, breathing deep and slow. There he'd think of that woman again. This time, he'd captivate her with his ideas, his plans, his sense of drive. No mention of the zoo, Eula, the animals, and for one glorious half-minute, he would be free of the feelings that pounded his body by day and night, the images that confused him as he slept. Your business can be anything you want it to be, Dirk thought, so long as it doesn't boast any tours. Chapter 2 It was Patrick's idea to swap jobs in the first place. He'd worked as the zoo's custodian, picking up cigarette butts, maps, paper pizza plates, and empty soda cans, and carrying the animal shit from behind the cages to the great golden trash can at the park's north end. He also discovered that he didn't like the job very much. Half, half a year, half a year deep, he could barely stand patrolling the grounds in the brown jumpsuit with its clever slogan across the back in white. Someone has to clean up after these guys, and no one was well. No one, and no matter how well he washed it, he couldn't really shake that bird shit stench that followed him home. This coupled with the daily carving of hippo apples out of the grooves of his shoes brought him squarely to the edge. Being spotted in this state by Cheryl Connors, his high school crush who couldn't believe he still lived in town and who seemed to plug her nose in defiance of his olfactory montage, pushed him over it. Let's trade jobs, he said to Dirk one night, also over beers. You start cleaning up the zoo and I'll start riding the back of that truck. Dirk had been a goblin garbage man for months. He'd cleaned the parish park, washed the steel lids of the goblin graves, picked up the trash along every throughway, washed the windows at the woodruff, and once worked the same landscape crew as goblin's most celebrated citizen, Wayne Sherman, mastermind of the hedges. I've walked dogs before, Dirk said, but Patrick cut him off. You won't actually be handling any animals, just their shit. Rob Jake, Robin Jacobs, known to many as Goblin's biggest asshole and also owner of the zoo, didn't care who stained their fingertips with other people's cigarette butts or who scooped elephant logs into black bags, as long as that someone showed up every day to do it. He agreed to Patrick's job swap and just as quickly handed Dirk a brown jumpsuit. Ah, but you're a big one, Robin said, holding the brown fabric up to Dirk's chest. As big as Eula, I'd say. Hope that doesn't mean you're also a big problem. Welcome to the Hardy Carroll Goblin Zoo. Goblin Sanitation had no reservations about the switch, either, and so Patrick traded the odor of Goblin's animals for the smell of Goblin's trash. But right as it felt, there was one thing he was very wrong about. Not only would Dirk be handling the animals after all, he would very soon become the face that every gobliner thought of when he or she recalled the Goblin Zoo. Dirk would become a celebrity there. He'd own the place, but not like he was the boss. Not that kind of owning. And that semantic would haunt him as darkly as the dreams of leading children down long stone hallways, walls cloaked in webs. Stone slabs so old that Dirk would wake shaking, desperate to know what sort of animals howled and laughed, boomed and bellowed beyond them. Chapter 3 It couldn't really be stopped. Dirk worked the zoo was akin to Hercules getting his shield, a mythical match. His bulking 38-year-old frame was an eye-popping for the children as the polar bears. His big mitt hands could make an entire unfolded map vanish in a single swipe. He could carry six bags of shit at once, Patrick could barely manage two, and for reasons not wholly understood by any of his co-workers or himself, Dirk had an immediate calming effect on the animals. Was it simply his size? His vibe? What exactly emanated from Dirk that soothed Eula just as she began beating her chest in despair? What unseen element brought the lions to seas roaring as he approached? <clears throat> Dirk noticed the changes in behavior. Oh, that sort of thing happens here, Gordon McCall, one of the animal feeders, told him over lunch one day. There's the animals that the civilians see, and the animals on their best behavior, the constant flow of people passing their windows, gobliners there to watch them eat, 
watch the meat. I don't care how sentient you are. A living thing must act differently when it knows it's being watched. How could it not? But there's this other side, the side that we get to see. The zoo closes, we get it dark around here and the animals crouch back into their isolation. Their first minute all day they get to themselves, the first chance they get to think and maybe in a way to be the closest they can to what they were before they went and got caged. And that thing, Dirk, that state an animal can get into is a scary thing. You don't want to approach an animal when he's there, when he's returned that original state, where something like a man and man's authority suddenly stops meaning anything. But none of this was what Dirk was really talking about. They just seem different around me, he said. Yeah, well, sounds like you're just catching lions being lions. Don't start thinking you have some magic power over them or you're going to go nuts when they misbehave. Dirk sat on the bench long after Gordon left him and replayed the way the bears lifted their heads to watch him pass or spider monkeys hung by one arm, pointing at Dirk with the other. One night at closing time in his second week on the job, a possible explanation popped up unasked for. They know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Up here, he tapped his head. I'm caged too. It was something like a aha by Dirk's standards, an epiphany. He walked towards Trudy, the tiger's cage in a foggy daze, realizing for the first time how badly he wanted to free his own mind. He followed the painted footstep on, onto the concrete, first the little bird feet in yellow, then the alligator feet in green, the white bear paws, the brown hippo toes, and Trudy's faded orange. Passing through the wood sliding doors in the, to the tiger habitat, he entered the incredible darkness that was housed here, that housed her. He had a vague sense of purpose that meeting with Trudy just then was a meaningful thing for him to do. But just like the goblin sky was so often rainy and fog accumulated as easily as gnats, Dirk didn't have a clear idea of what that purpose was. He felt along the wall for the flip switch and Trudy's rusty cage came to life under the bright overhead light. Wood chips and brown grass decorated the floor at the front of her cage. Dirk saw the huge tree trunk leaning against the far wall for Trudy to climb. And as he pressed his forehead to the bars, he saw the remains of her evening meal. Big bones lay crisscross over a dark purple stain in the concrete. But Trudy was invisible. Not yet. Trudy? He eyed the big rock in the shadows. She's back there, he thought. He was about to call her name again when he saw the darkness upon the rock shift and the shape emerged of a cat much bigger than Dirk remembered. Trudy stood still at the edge of that darkness, the orange of her body receding into the shadow like the very first flames of a new fire. Dirk slowly put his hand through the bars. Trudy lifted her shoulders and hissed, but a hiss in name alone, for what escaped her throat was not the same sound made by a house cat. Trudy. Hello, I'm caged too. Now the tiger came forward, descending the rock with agility of free thought. Trudy went to his outstretched hand and sniffed him once, an intake of breath that was louder than Dirk's voice. Dirk pulled his hand from the cage. He held the bars, his forehead still pressed to the steel. He held Trudy's gaze too. How do we get out of here? He asked her. Then he tapped his finger to his head. He didn't know it then, but the first few pounds of the weight of the world had been placed upon his shoulders. Still looking into the eyes of the great cat, Dirk started experiencing a restlessness that would build within a brewing discontent, a, con a concept too sloppily made to speak of. Suddenly, he wanted his insides to swell up beyond the limits of his skin, swell to such a size that his body would finally spit Freeing the man within, Trudy sat before him and tilted her head at an angle that suggested she was curious as to what he was thinking. I'm being silly, he said, worrying about worrying, thinking about thinking, wondering if I'm in the right place. You know what I think, Trudy? I think you and I are passing ships, you know, big boats in the same water. Here we are, meeting 
but very soon I'll be out of this place, running my own business, married, my own boss. And when I am, I'll come back and buy you and Eula, some of the others too. And in my house, there won't be any cages. He smiled as the tears rolled down his face. I won't be here for long. But he was wrong about that. Rather than become a zoo sensation, and with each new promotion, Dirk would understand less and less about the ropes tying him in place, the cage he wanted to bust out of lowering from the rainy green goblin sky. I just lost my place in this book. That's how awesome it was. I hope you enjoyed. Have a good night, everybody.